Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 64th session of the Med AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Ram with us to present his research on explaining model decisions and fixing them through human feedback. Ram is a senior machine learning scientist at Atera. Prior to this, he was a senior research scientist at Salesforce. He did his PhD in computer science at Georgia Tech, advised by David Perrick. He works at the intersection of machine learning, computer vision, and language, explainable AI, and more recently, medical AI. He has held visiting positions at Brown University, Oxford University, Meta, Samsung, Microsoft, and Tesla Autopilot. He has a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering, as well as a master's in physics at Beats P Learning. Thank you so much, Ron, for joining us today. Before we start, could you tell us your preference on when you want to take questions? Yeah, please feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions or any thoughts you might have. So yeah, we'll make this interactive. Yeah. Okay, sounds great. So let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Ron. Thank you so much, C and Andita, for inviting me here. I really did not realize this is the 64th uh, uh, occurrence. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, as he introduced, thank you for the great introduction, by the way. Um, I'm Ram Prasad, and uh, I'm going to be uh, discussing some works on explaining the decision making process of deep networks um, and how understanding the decision process would ha will help us fix various characteristics of the model. So, yeah, so we are you know, currently inching closer towards uh, having fully autonomous systems which can transport us to our work every day. Um, but when these systems fail, you know, they fail spectacularly disgracefully, leaving an end user staring at an incoherent output, wondering why the system did what it did. And unfortunately, we seem to be currently living in a world where machine learning based mistakes gain far more attention than human errors. Um, and very soon these machines uh, would be assisting doctors in performing surgeries. Um, and if the model suggests something out of ordinary, we wouldn't know if performing that would lead to a catastrophic failure, or is it just something really interesting that we haven't uh, had a chance to try yet. Um, so I believe we need interpretability in order to build trust in intelligent systems and uh, to move forward and uh, uh, have a successful integration and a meaningful integration into our everyday lives. And uh, this involves building transparent models that have the ability to explain to us you know, why they predict what they predict. And uh, I believe that this transparency and the ability to explain um, you know, is super useful in three different stages of AI evolution. Uh, first, when an AI is significantly weaker uh, than humans and not yet readily deployable, to take the case of you know, visual reasoning, the goal of transparency and explanations could be to identify failure modes, thereby helping researchers focus their refer efforts on uh, most fruitful research directions. And uh, second, when an AI is on par with humans and uh, readily deployable, for example, image classification trained on sufficient data, uh, the goal could be to establish appropriate trust and confidence in users. Um, and third, when an AI is actually significantly stronger than a human, for example, a chess or go, uh, the goal of explanations could be machine teaching. That is a machine teaching um, humans as to how to make better decisions. So, um, so what we want to do now, we want to focus on uh, the first part. Um, um, so we're going to be talking about uh, explanations. Um, and we, in particular, we're going to be talking about uh, explanations from GradCam. Um, so yeah, so the question that we are asking is, um, how can we explain decisions from deep models? Give me one second. Yeah, uh, I want to go with the talk outline. Uh, so uh, in the first um, 
at first i'll be talking Don't see about your slides yet oh, oh okay thank you all right perfect yeah so here's the outline of the talk uh, i'll be first talk i'll first be talking about explaining decisions made by deep models and uh, next i'll talk about how we can use the insights gained from these explanations to understand when models are biased and uh, work on debiasing them uh, following that i'm going to talk about how we can use explanations um, as a way for humans to transfer knowledge and um, finally discuss what i think is next for explainable ai um, as you can see in the first part i'll be talking about explanation uh, about explaining model decisions and in the second and third parts i'll be talking about how these explanations can be used to fix various characteristics of the model yeah uh, coming to explanations uh, the question that we're asking is how can we explain decisions from deep models and uh, specifically we are uh, focusing on the word explanations and in the visual side uh, we are basically asking the question where does the system look when making decisions there have been uh, a variety of approaches to explain networks uh, the first set of explanations were gradient based methods such as backprop guided backprop uh, layer wise relevance propagation integrated radians, gradcam, and so on. And uh, there have been works that uh, simplify the network architecture to make uh, it easier to explain uh, the network. And uh, uh, some of these examples are uh, class activation mapping. And then we have approaches that considered, uh, you know, the model as black box. Um, and uh, so there have been I mean, this is a ever growing field. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of new approaches which can be categorized in uh, one of these buckets. Uh, today, I'm going to be specifically uh, talking about RADCAM and um, uh, and uh, how people have, uh, we and people have used it for uh, different uh, uh, ways to uh, understand and diagnose networks. Um, so, uh, so you have an image, let's say this is an image of a dog and a cat. You feed it through the convolutional layers of a CNN um, to get feature activation maps. And uh, these maps can be used for any tasks. Uh, let's take the case of image classification where you might have a couple of fully connected layers followed by a final classification layer. And let's say the model predicted tiger cat. We want to first understand which neurons are most important for this particular uh, uh, decision. So we compute the gradients of the logits with respect to uh, logits of tiger, the class tiger cat with respect to the last convolutional layer activations, and these give us uh, some kind of feature importance. We global average pool these gradients to get uh, a weight for each of the neuron in your convolutional layer. And then in order to explain this particular image, uh, so we combine these gradient weights, we call these neuron important weights, um, with our uh, forward activation maps, and then remove the negative values to get RADCAM. So this, as you can see, is a heat map over uh, that can be imposed uh, over the original image to understand why the network uh, predicted, predicted a particular category that we care about. Um, like I said, we can actually do this for any task. Uh, we can take the case of image captioning, where you have uh, the network predicting, let's say, a cat uh, laying on the ground. And similarly, you can do that for uh, even uh, more complex tasks, which have more modalities. Um, and so all that is required here uh, for you to do this is for your network to be differentiable from the final logits to your uh, to the layer, uh, last convolutional layer. And this is the case for almost all networks that we train. Um, so it's fairly applicable. Um, you can actually combine this with earlier approaches like, um, you know, guided back propagation to get much more finer grained visualizations highlighting what in that region is the model paying attention to. So here you can see that uh, it's not just highlighting the cat regions, 
these seem to be particularly highlighting uh, the stripes of the cat which are more prominent for predicting the category tiger cat um, you can visualize any decision here even the decision that the model did not make for example here is another category dog um, uh, also boxes we if you try to visualize where the network would have to look um, you can do the same thing but uh, compute the gradients differently and you can actually get um, the model uh, we can see that the model is looking at the dog regions so yeah what do we do with these insights i had a quick uh, question Ram, yeah. actually before you move on okay. so in your previous uh, uh, so in this slide basically i think it's, it's super cool that um, so for each class we can kind of look at where the model is, is probably focusing its um, attention on how would you reason about tasks like um, like captioning or something where the um, interaction between different classes found in the image actually uh, like needs a little more nuance. For instance, if the caption is like the dog is uh, standing on top of a table or something, is the explanation wrong if it does not focus on the table or how? Well, that's, a, that's a great point. Actually, I have a very similar um, looking caption and what our model does. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we look at that. So in those scenarios in captioning, um, like what we can do is to uh, not just visualize one uh, feature, uh, one activation map, but you can actually do that for every word that the network is predicting. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to you know uh, get around that issue. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll wait for your explanation on that. Um, just one more question. Maybe you'll address this later in your talk. But um, um, I guess last week from our speakers um, talk on saliency for chest X-rays, like one of the questions that came about was if we are predicting, say, risk scores or something that uh, might happen in the future from an image, where should we like, is it do we even know where the model should actually, you know, um, give its attention to? And so would also like your thoughts on like how to approach some task like that, um, like future risk prediction or, or things like that, or just a regression. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's a great point. Um, I think I have one slide on chest x-rays, uh, but um, my, okay, we'll talk about that um, when we get there, yeah. Sounds good, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing that we did was to visualize image captioning models, and uh, just like Nandita pointed out, um, like here, uh, in this work, we have been trying to visualize as a whole, what is the network looking at? uh in the image for example for this uh, image this is one of the first uh one of the earliest deep uh, deep learning based captioning system and this uh, for this image the model predicted a group of people flying kites on a beach and uh, if you look at uh, the grad cam visualizations you can see that they seem to be looking at uh, the flying objects and a little bit um, at the uh, people uh, beneath and um, like for this image, the model seemed to predict a man is sitting at a table with a pizza and the explanation seems to be um, looking at the man and a little bit at the pizza and uh, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of the person sitting. Um, so uh, what could be happening here is that the language model could be taking over and could be hallucinating things that don't exist. Uh, similarly, here is GradCam applied to visual question answering, where the task is given an image and a natural language question asking is what is the person hitting? The model seems to look at the ball and uses a little bit of the context to answer tennis ball. So the interesting finding that we had uh, was that we literally just took an existing uh, model uh, that has no attention, no way to you know interpret and then uh, directly we were able to get explanations. And uh, the surprising part was that even simple models uh, seem to somehow learn to attend to appropriate regions. This was, uh, this was quite surprising to us because like uh, there have been, uh, people have been suggesting a lot of attention-based models, but these, uh, uh, results suggest that may, as long as your network can do uh, 
better you you have post hoc ways to explain things rather than you know building these things uh, into your network um yeah so uh, one thing that we did uh, is to analyze failure modes of networks so for this image the model uh, predicted this to be a car mirror so like it, it to me it doesn't make much sense but if you look if you look at the explanation here like oh yeah looking at the explanation you can kind of see that it looks like a car mirror and uh, here uh, the ground truth is volcano for this image and you can see that it correctly highlights the volcano and for this image the model predicted this to be a wine snake and if you look at the explanation it looks like the explanation looks very much like uh, a snake a part of a snake and of course when you try to visualize for the ground truth category coil it looks at the entirety of the regions so uh, the thing that we see is that even unreasonable predictions sometimes have reasonable explanations so models are not completely off um so yeah we do have a demo um, at this website you, you can try out different models you can give your own input images text and uh, you should be able to see explanations um people have extended this for uh, several medical uh, AI tasks in fact most papers that use grad camera from the medical domain um, so I see uh, works that uh, you know do that cam for melanoma detection, um, and even here at Artera we have uh, uh, we use grad cam to understand um, and predict patient outcomes, and uh, like this kind of relates to uh, your question on uh, you know where should the model look at uh, to predict the future? Like I feel like. Um, uh, ideally, the explanation should be that, okay, what are these, if I'm going to say that um, this person is going to have uh, a distance metastasis, meaning the, the, the tumor, the cancer that they have would, is going to spread to different regions, uh, if the model is predicting that uh, based on an image and uh, some clinical variables, if the model can now tell me that among all the um, cancer regions, like which of the regions is most likely to you know cause a particular you know outcome so that's the hope at least there should be you know much more rigorous studies as to yeah uh, to understand if uh, uh, these explanations really are saying that um, and that's uh, something that we need to look at um, and people have applied it for COVID detection uh, more interestingly, I found that uh, some people have found that uh, uh, through found through explanations that because a lot of models were hastily developed during the pandemic, uh, a lot of COVID detection models uh, hastily developed during the pandemic, uh, there are some models that you know they simply pick up on the imaging markers of the X-rays, and uh, there been some people have found that um, you know patients that were lying down um uh, when when their x-ray was taken like the model was focusing on that aspect because the people if they are lying down that means that they have a worse case of covid and so like models seem to be you know, relying on these things um so this seems to be a real world example of you know the need for explainability for understanding and developing models that can be trustworthy for you know real world deployment and uh, people have applied uh, GradCam for uh, video classification tasks. Um, here's an example where um, the class was push pushing something, but you can see that uh, as the hand approaches, the regions that can be pushed are already getting highlighted. Um, so that was an interesting fi finding. Um, and we have also extended GradCam to beyond CNN architectures uh, to multimodal transformers. Uh, this was a new paper where we introduced a vision language pre-training framework, ALBEF. And uh, here are some visualizations from ALBEF. So this, I think, might answer your question uh, about uh, um, how, how do we 
um, for captioning models, like is the best way to you know get an entirety of the visualization map or you know word to word. So here uh, the caption was a little girl holding a kitten next to a blue fence. And you can see for the girl, the attention seems to be on the face. For holding, it seems to be, you know, uh, regions where, you know, she is touching the cat. And, um, and more interestingly, for the word next, it seems to be looking at imp important regions around the girl. Um, so um, you can see that it seems to be looking at the fence already. Um, yeah, and uh, this is um, uh, explanations for uh, a VQA model based on ALBEF uh, display training framework. Um, is this noodle soup? Uh, is this rice noodle soup? For the answer, yes, it looks at uh, you know the rice regions in the bowl and chopsticks. It attends to the chopsticks. And what is the man doing in the street? Walking. It looks at the man, and more interestingly, it looks at the legs of the man. And again, if you change it to, you know, like what does the truck sell, uh, ice cream, and it looks at the ice cream truck. Um, so yeah, coming back to the three stages of AI evolution, um, I would like to think that we are still in the first regime where humans are still worse than AI. And, uh, you know, for this regime, um, like, um, I want to look at you know, how explanations can improve various aspects of the models. Um, yeah, any questions so far? Um, I had one actually. Yeah. I think this is super cool the the captioning part uh, to see the um, like how the model is actually looking at the right things. Um, do you have a sense of? I feel like the best way to evaluate these um, explanations are like just looking qualitatively at. A bunch of them but given that we have huge data sets and we kind of want to make sure like even to analyze failure cases we need to identify the failure cases so um do you have a sense of like how to translate this from a qualitative thing to yeah 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 uh, let me try to pull up a slide um Oh, and if it, if you feel you can answer this better at the at the like after you finish your well, that's, rest, that's, that's okay. <laughs> that should be fine. No worries. Uh, let me. Yeah. So uh, we can evaluate explanations through different ways. Like you know, first thing we want to know is how faithful is the explanation to an underlying model. Like, uh, is the model actually doing things uh, based on the regions that the network is looking at? The one way to do this could be to, you know, like you block the regions that the network is saying is important and see what, uh, how the network actually, uh, the uh, things changes, right? Like how does the score change? Like other thing about explanations is like, people should be, explanations are meant for humans. And if humans are not able to interpret and make sense of these, then uh, that's not a good enough explanation. Um, and of course, the cost of computing this shouldn't be much. And uh, you should not be having to, you know, simplify the network, or make it make uh, get a simpler model and then explain that you uh, want to be able to maintain the performance and explain the model that was given. So uh, in our paper, we did evaluate along these, I mean, at least uh, many of these dimensions. So, yeah. Um, awesome. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so until now, we have been using explainable uh, interpretability to ex establish trust with humans and understand uh, the failures, but I wanted to see if we can do something more. Like, can we use this tool uh, to understand the biases learned by models and debias them? Um, so in this, uh, uh, one of the first work that I want to talk about is um, on how we can use the insights from explanations to overcome gender bias. 
So uh, this was work by uh, Kylie and Lisa uh, presented at ECCB. Uh, it's called Women Also Snowboard. Um, and here, um, so we have an image captioning model, uh, which yeah, given this image incorrectly predicts a man sitting at a desk with a laptop computer. But if you look at where the model is looking at when, uh, when it is generating the word man, it seems to be looking at the computer. And, uh, but what do we want our models to do? We want it to first predict the gender correctly and also point to the women, right? So we want models that are right for the right reasons. So ideally we wanted the network to predict a women. Um, and so it's, I think it's important to also think about reasons why uh, our models are making predictions, making correct predictions, even because sometimes it can be correct but it can be correct for the wrong reasons. Here, it correctly predicts uh, this person to be a man, but it looks at the little bit of the tennis racket and not the man. So ideally we want uh, models to be looking at uh, the right regions corresponding to the man for predicting men. So they introduced this uh, framework um, called the equalizer uh, model that uh, that has the same loss that you would have uh, regular uh, softmax based cross entropy loss and then uh, they have uh, something called a confident loss that is if the model if the image has uh, gender um, that is visible then the we uh, we want the model to be confident in predicting that word and uh, for some images, like where you have access to, you know, ground truth segmentations, you can actually block out the regions corresponding uh, to the person and then make the network be less confident in the gender that it is predicting. So what this uh, encourages the model to do is to be somewhat vague about, you know, uh, uh, captions, uh, vague when predicting these, um, uh, gendered words. So uh, they saw that um, you can see that the explanation now, um, like a woman holding a cat in her arms is for the word woman, it was looking at the cat before, but now it correctly predicts man and also looks at the man when predicting the word. And here a man sitting on a couch with a laptop computer, it looks at the laptop uh, when um, when asked to localize man, but now because the uh, person is not visible, um, like the after you apply this model, it seems to be gen giving generic responses like a person laying on a bed with a laptop. So, so uh, the next work that I want to talk about is how we can use explanations to tackle the distribution shift problem. So this is our work at ICCV um, called uh, Taking a Hint, Leveraging Explanations to Improve Grounding in Vision and Language. So um, like many vision and language models have this problem of using statistical correlations um, in the training data to arrive at decisions. And um, like if you give an image, um, most likely the, um, a uh, model would predict a giraffe standing next to a tree, even though there is no tree. If you go back and see why that could, this could be happening, most images in Coco, which have giraffes, uh, uh, occur uh, with trees around. And uh, similarly for VQA, if you ask what color are the bananas, one of the earliest models would simply answer yellow because most bananas are yellow. Uh, but if you go back and see, uh, the training data, you can see that models are uh, actually, you know, uh, like most of your data is very biased. Um, and uh, so these models still work, like still give very good accuracies, uh, but that's mainly because your test distribution is very similar to the uh, training distribution. The moment you change uh, the distributions at test time, uh, this problem is even more prevalent. And uh, there was a new split of the VQA dataset where they explicitly changed 
the distribution of train and test set and found that models perform poorly. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to first understand where do models look, um, where, where do humans look when making decisions. So this was earlier work from my lab where, uh, um, where people are given a blurred version of the image and a question. Uh, for example, what room is this? Um, uh, people on Amazon Mechanical Turk were asked to, you know, de-blur regions that they think are important and then answer the question. And this is available for a small subset of the data set, uh, of the main VQA data set. So what we did was to, you know, understand what's happening, uh, like given an image um, and the question, what room is this? Let's say it incorrectly predicted dining room. And uh, we try to understand through GradCam where the network seemed to be looking at. And it seems to be looking more at these regions than these regions. And so we wanted to use human explanations to make machines look at similar regions. And um, so when you're computing GradCam, essentially uh, the network, the highlighted, uh, you know, arrows, the corresponding to the parameters are the ones that get updated. So essentially you're trying to make your, uh, make the layers of your network focus more on you know, uh, looking at the right, uh, you know, regions. And uh, what we find by doing this is like, we observe about a 7% um, percentage point improvement uh, when, when the distribution change and, uh, and minor improvements, uh, you know, even in the regular VQA. Um, so what this says is, you know, making machines look at regions similar to humans, you know, makes them generalize to arbitrary distributions better. Um, an example of that, uh, like when we applied this to captioning models, here, uh, the question, I mean, the caption is a bathroom sink with a toothbrush, soap dispenser, and a mirror. And if you try to visualize for the word toothbrush, where is the network looking at? And it seems to be looking, yeah, the toothbrush, but more a generic region around uh, the toothbrush as well. But uh, once you apply hint, um, like you can see that uh, models seem to be looking much more at the toothbrush than before. And uh, similarly, uh, we see that um, uh, the model even seems to be attending at the cat, rather the shadow of the cat um, here. Um, so yeah. Uh, may I ask a question here? So in this uh, hint, um, so basically the data, the data set is uh, the ranking is obtained by like, um, like a, a brushing of like a, a blurred image by human, right? So I feel like this, cause like sometimes we don't really know which region is important. Before blurring. Uh, yeah, by looking at the blurred image, so yeah. just randomly blur, uh, randomly like brush, yeah, uh, yeah a region, yeah. and then we realize all this, we don't know which region this is, so we, we were like, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, like, um, the thing is, when we ask humans, this is not the first iteration. The in the first iteration, we gave the entire image. Uh, to the people um, and then ask them to unblur, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, ask them to just mark the regions that are important. Mm -hmm. so people are, uh, people are trying to do many, many tasks. So they, there is no incentive for them to, you know, highlight all the uh, correct regions. Yeah. If you go, you know, completely flip side and you don't give them anything and you want them to unblur, uh, like you give them a black image and you want them to unblur that will make it much more noisy. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, so that's where we came to, uh, you know, um, like we made the decision to, you know, like show a little bit of the image. And one way to do that would be to, you know, uh, just blur the image and give that. So that's not the most ideal, uh, but uh, yeah, like in a world where, uh, you know, where, uh, we it's where your mechanical tasks are not you know gameable 
I think we would have gotten a much better data set. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I I actually think um an interesting way uh in the medical like say uh chest X rays uh it would be interesting if we have uh, we use like observational data say eye tracking. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. So that I think eye tracking data might be more uh yeah, like, more accurate yeah. than. Yeah, and we've, the systems have been uh, getting better and better, and I feel like you know, and it's it's no cost, right? Like, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people can just you know, people are doing the task that they were initially told, which is to answer right. questions, mm -hmm. and then like you just notice where they look at. So yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, another. Uh, oh yeah, of okay. course. So will hint actually change, like um, correct all the errors, let's say, like in your previous example, a banana was marked as, uh, the color of a banana was marked yellow, even though it was green. Would hint be able to solve those kind of things? Because the region will still be the same, but um, yeah, color is something that's, that's like- question. So essentially we are trying to, um, you know, make models look more at the, uh, you know, look more at the image and not go by priors. So that's the focus that we have been, you know, uh, doing. And your question uh, is going to be addressed in uh, in another project. So, uh, in fact, very similar to you know what you had asked for. So you'll you'll okay. see. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Um, yeah. So explanations to improve uh, self-supervised representation learning. Um, so this was our work last CVPR. Um, so contrastive learning works by, you know, um, like we're trying to learn visual representations from unlabeled images through the task of instance discrimination. So uh, you can see that, you know, uh, when you give an image and, you know, take two different crops of the same image, and then you're basically trying to make them uh, similar, uh, make the rep uh, uh, representations of the uh, crops coming from the same image similar and uh, make them far move farther away from, you know, some random set of images. And uh, people have found that, you know, uh, approaches have begun to outperform even fully supervised ImageNet pre-training um, on several tasks. Uh, but unfortunately, their success have been confined to unlabeled ImageNet images and a naive application of these approaches to, you know, uncurated web images has only shown marginal gains. And we wanted to, we, we see that, you know, networks are not able to generalize to, you know, as a, these methods are not able to generalize to arbitrary images. And we wanted to understand why through the lens of GradCam. And uh, one thing that we noticed was, you know, models have poor visual learning ability. We saw earlier that even in cases where you have labels, networks learn to cheat. Here in self-supervised learning, there are no labels. So there's there many, many more ways for networks to cheat. Um, so here, if you, uh, if, you, if you ask what makes the query and the key representation similar, um, models seem to be relying on the grass. So they exploit lower levels, visual cues, uh, or spurious background correlations. And uh, so sometimes you, when you have a complex image, you might have, you know, uh, different views, uh, like views that don't even seem like they are from the same image. Um, and so this might discourage semantic understanding. Um, so uh, we introduced uh, a way to use unsupervised saliency maps. So essentially, um, we, we make sure that we get uh, two crops that contain a salient object, and we also know where the salient object occurs. Um, now, uh, we introduce an approach called CAST. Um, the simple idea is to just encourage models to rely on appropriate salient regions during the pre-training stage. So what we do is given an image and uh, a saliency map, uh, this is an unsupervised saliency map. We, you know, use that to construct two different crops of the image and then we feed uh, um, feed the two images to a query encoder and a momentum encoder 
and then um, we the regular uh, contrastive laws would be to uh, make the queries representation similar to the key representation and further from a set of negatives. Um, and now we also have a masked key. And this masked key contains just the salient regions in the key crop. Um, we then compute the gradient of the dot product of the last, con I mean, dot product of the um, um, of the two representations with respect to the last convolutional layer of the query encoder. Um, and then we, you know, global average pool the gradients and combine them with the forward activation maps like we saw before to get grad cam. So here you can see that the network seems to be looking at not not the sheep but you know some other regions around the sheep but we know what are the most salient regions here so we can you know provide a loss here encouraging the models to you know look only at the important and salient regions of the sheep and uh, what we find uh, is that these networks you know after convergence essentially you are asking them to look at appropriate regions and this makes them obtain much more grounded representations and uh, you know in addition to perform outperforming moco on all the tasks uh, uh, we find that you know cast pre-training on you know coco which is a 10x smaller data set than imagenet even outperforms fully supervised uh, pre-training um, um, on on all the fine-tuning tasks that we you know we evaluated on and interestingly we find that this improved grounding during the pre-training stage also transfers to downstream tasks as well. Basically note how uh, the ImageNet fully supervised model uh, like looks at uh, the background as well to predict the category ball player. Whereas uh, the cast pre-trained model, you know, seems to look only at the player. Um, and uh, so we also see that, you know, models seem to attend to the whole extent of the objects like this, you see the cast model. Um, interestingly, we also, uh, you know, ran, uh, tried to test the robustness of cast. Uh, we took a data set, which, you know, changes the background, takes the foreground, uh, foreground and uh, puts different background um, at the back. And you can see that, you know, models that are trained with cast, uh, you know, significantly outperform uh, in all the settings. Um, and uh, it, here's an example of if you take image of a bird and you replace the sky with water, like your gram, your model actually, uh, if you if the model is relying on the background, it will change its prediction to fish. Uh, but then uh, casted models which rely on the foreground, they still look at the bird um, and predict bird. Here, if you take this image and replace um, replace the background with, you know, uh, uh, to a place where musical instruments typically occur, the prediction of, uh, you know, uh, cast pre-trained models does not change uh, as opposed to, you know, MOCO. So, yeah, uh, so far I talked about how we can explain decisions from deep networks and how we can use these explanations to understand when they are biased and make them look at appropriate regions and thereby debiasing them. Uh, in the next next work, I want to talk about how we can, um, you know, use explanations to um, uh, to improve different characteristics of the model, like uh, how do we uh, distill uh, human knowledge into networks. In the interest of time, let me... Yeah. So yeah, sure. Um, one of the works that I want to talk about is how we can make uh, explanations to you know make models reason compositionally. So in this, uh, I want to talk about our uh, CVPI work on uh, squinting at VKO models, uh, introspecting VKO models with sub questions. Um, so we designed VQM models for us to be able to have 
useful you know meaningful conversation uh with machines and you know help us uh, in everyday activities um here uh there's a, a blind person who takes a picture of bananas and asks if they like uh, is the banana ripe enough for me to eat the model might say yes they're like oh great but just to confirm we are asking this question is the banana mostly green or yellow uh and it says green so we are like wait it seemed to answer a much more complicated question about the ripeness of something but it seems to fail on a simple perception based uh question uh so like um just you think visual explanation here might not have helped you understand why this might be happening so we needed to dig deeper and uh, go beyond uh, visual explanations um to understand the reasoning process and fix the reasoning process of deep networks um along these lines we introduced a dataset called vqa introspect dataset um so we showed uh, humans an image and a question that requires reasoning and asked them to provide simple perception based question answer pairs that were you that are useful that are helpful for answering the main question for example is this a keepsake photo yes um for the answer yes people have, people talk about the black and white photo and here is the giraffe at the zoo uh people talk about uh, the existence of a fence around and the shortness of the grass here uh, does this appear to be an emergency people talk about the um, existence of you know ambulance and you know people in the middle of the road uh is this a good idea for the rainy day people uh, tend to talk about the existence of the roof on the vehicle um so uh we use this data set to understand what's going on with uh, networks and we find that um 28% of the times the model is right but for the wrong reasons that is it got the main reasoning question correct but answered a simple perception based uh, sub question incorrect um so we introduced um uh, an approach called squint sub question importance aware network tuning uh, so you have an image uh, and a question what season is this um this is a question that requires you to reason about things in the image um uh, a sub question could be um is there a christmas tree pictured on a cell phone so like we would have ideally wanted the network to look at the christmas tree to answer that it's winter um so um here uh, basically we encouraged that behavior we wanted the network to focus on uh, the attention for the simple perception question um uh, and then answer the main question and we found that uh, that improved the reasoning ability of the models and also uh, models seem to get much more consistent so essentially what we find is that you know human like compositional reasoning can help machines reason better and be more consistent and uh, we also we um, extended this um, uh, this work at nacl where we introduced the concept of relevant sub questions and irrelevant sub questions for answering the main reasoning question and uh, and we found that uh, you know that can help models understand uh what to use and what not to use in order to answer complex questions um yeah so far we you know talked about you know how can we explain networks and how we can understand when networks are biased and use these uh use these insights to improve uh, to debias networks and distill knowledge between humans and ai um i also want to use just a minute or two to you know talk about you know what i think is ahead for explainable ai um and more specifically uh, i want to talk about uh, my thoughts on um uh, thoughts along the healthcare space uh, explainable ai for healthcare so what i currently feel is that uh, the focus seems to be more on you know convincing clinicians and others uh, that models are right for the right reasons 
um that is wonderful that's that's a great start uh, but i feel that uh, there is less focus on using these insights um uh, from explanations uh, to improve models um so we need to we need to be okay with the fact that our yeah, models are not perfect so moving forward uh, like i feel like it's important for developers and clinicians to be aware of the limitations of ai models um this can be through explanations or different kind of modalities and uh, find a way to you know collaboratively work um towards diagnosing models and therefore diagnosing patients um with that uh, i would like to conclude this talk i would also like to mention that our team at artera is hiring researchers so please do reach out to me or see here uh, to um learn more about our work um, that we do at artera and um, i'm happy to take questions now thank you so much ron for the very comprehensive uh, rep uh presentation um, before we open the floor for questions, let's um, all give Ram a round of virtual applause. Thank, Thank you. you, Ram. I believe uh, most of us have uh, used GRACM as at some point in our research projects. So I hope that uh, today's session is uh, is very helpful for everyone. Thanks. So yeah, is there any question for the audience? Um, I have a question, but I can pause to let other people ask first. But if there is, um, like if other people are still thinking about their questions, I can get started. Okay. So um, I found your, uh, the, the cast method to be super interesting, where you used um, unsupervised say DNC methods for actually identifying the masks for um, contrastive learning for, you know, more principled cropping rather than um, random cropping. Do you have a sense of, um, like it, it seems to me that the this method works really well because the unsupervised saliency methods are doing their job reasonably well. Um, how can one try to, like if, like in the medical domain, for instance, unsupervised saliency methods do not give very great um, uh, segmentation. So do you have any thoughts on how we can like, mitigate that if we have something um, of that aspect. Yeah, um, like the overall goal of this work was to uh, see if networks ground correctly. And, um, and uh, one very simple thing that we used was to, you know, use uh, some kind of saliency. And as you can see here, even the saliency is not perfect, right? Like, Sure, this image has just sheep, right? But there could be different um, different kind of uh, things that exist, right? How do we encode? How do we encode different classes in this kind of um, in this um, in this loss? Uh, but what we actually found was practically like that did not lead to uh, improvements in performance, and that's mainly because we found. Uh, most of the images, uh, at least in our data set, to you know contain you know very few number of objects. Um, and uh, second, coming to your question on um, you know what if you don't even have access to this? Like it's very hard to understand where to look at, right? Um, in those scenarios, I feel like um, you know, there have been some extensions to this work, which actually. Uh, found different in, instead of using saliency map if you can simply you know uh, get these maps by uh, you know like i mean you take one crop and try to you know uh, consider all different crops from the image and you know find a way to attend to uh, find a way to understand which of these crops is the network uh, you know mostly aligning with like even after you do some kind of augmentations like people have found that like that will uh, do a that will that's one way to you know get get rid of you know this assumption of having a saliency map and uh yeah uh beyond that i'm not um i'm not sure but 
um, if I think of something more, I'll, I'll get back. Yeah, this is super useful. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, I think people have found that a uh, vision transformer provides uh, or has like better inductive bios than CNNs. So have you found that vision transformers are like uh, provide better or more accurate explainability than CNNs? Uh, yeah, I was very, very surprised to see this. Um, um, like this kind of thing happen. Like, um, so I have visualized a ton of uh, image capturing models um, that were based on CNNs. And I was under the impression that, yeah, like it, it has a way to learn. Uh, like inductive biases are already encoded in CNNs. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of makes sense that that's doing a good job, uh, but I really did not expect transformers to also do such a good job at uh, localizing, um, you know, at, at this task of localization. Um, so I'm not sure why that is the case. Uh, it could be that um, all these, uh, there could be two things playing a role here. One, that uh, uh all the vision um, all the cnn based models that i was working on were literally trained for just this task of image captioning but these ones are trained uh with a lot more data so this we are basically trying to do pre-training here mm -hmm. right so you have um, access to a lot of data so um i'm not able to disentangle the data aspect and the model aspect here um so maybe it could for all we know it could be just because we this these ones are trained with millions of uh, images compared to you know cnn's trained on less number of images um yeah sounds good thanks is there any other questions If not, uh, let's thank Ram again for the presentation and uh, we will upload the recording of uh, his talk to our YouTube channel later. Um, just an announcement, next week, we are gonna take a break for Thanksgiving and we will be back uh, in two weeks. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And uh, thank and you so much for the, coming for the talk. Yeah, thank you. thanks everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. That was a great talk, Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.